So let's pull up the definition of uh, discipline. Discipline. Uh, nope, don't want that one. Oh, well, let's read it because they all, they all kind of go with each other. So the practice of training people to obey rules or a code of behavior uh, using punishment to correct disobedience. Uh, that's like when we used to do the push-ups and make people push and everything. That thing worked good, though, man. I'm, I'll tell you, I, I know, I know, say we got to bring it back in some form, man. I don't know. That thing, that that thing was that. Yes, you know what? Say say that lot. Say that on the mic. Say that on the mic. Because we talking about once upon a time, if one brother didn't meet his assignment, all of us would be held accountable for it because the idea was to look out for each other. I said that the result of what Captures brought out about ma us making the brothers push when things weren't done, when assignments weren't completed, when, when our orders weren't, weren't executed, is the foundation for why IUIC has grown to what it's grown to today. You have to understand, it's very difficult to manage thousands of people. And, and Captain Zakar brought out a, 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 good, a good scripture when Jethro told Moses he couldn't do it alone, but Moses wanted to. And he said you couldn't. One key thing that I got out of that, he said, because not only will you suffer, but the nation will suffer. If you can't get 100% of your leaders, you're not going to get 100% from your nation. Your nation, your leaders have to be, you as leaders, us as leaders, we need to be 100%. We, don't ha we have no room for failure. And that was the whole point that I'm bringing out. As a result of what was implemented in headquarters, because that's headquarters, make no mistake about it. New York is headquarters. What we started there was what evolved today. How we are able to control, execute, order, manipulate, and remain organized all around the world. Because there are schools all around the world, are they not? IUIC schools? This is, how, how do you handle that unless you were brought up from the foundation of being a good leader? You can't. How is Esau able to do it? They got military all over the world, right? Because they have structure in, within the military, which they got from us. So that's the point that, that, that I brought out. Don't, 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 don't look at what you, y'all are just coming in or came in two years, four years, even five years, six years, seven years. Y'all don't know what established this first. From purple chairs, everybody having purple chairs, to everybody having the bricks in the front, in the back. How do you control so many schools unless you had started a foundation? You set a trend amongst the leaders that came first. This is why Paul understood this message. And he always thanked and gave praise to the disciples that came before him. Meanwhile, almost three quarters of the New Testament was written by Paul. That's a humble spirit. And that's a man of wisdom that understands, okay, what it takes to build a nation. All right, let's pull that definition back up. And as you're going to find out as we bring out the class, discipline is the foundation to all these things, all right? That's the foundation for us to be able to move things forward, right? Um, click on the similitudes of the first one, which says similar, all right? Drop down on it. There we go. Uh, control, right? Cap used some of those words when he was just speaking, right? How we're able to control uh, those type of details in all the school. Regulation, right? Called rules and regs, ways that we have things set up, right? The way the searches are conducted, uh, the uniformity that we're all supposed to comply with, right? Di it, it provides direction, order, order, a measure of authority, rule, strictness, a firm hand, routine, regimen, training, teaching, instruction, drill, drilling, exercise, right? Uh, scroll down. Is there any more on this one? Scroll, scroll, no, nope, keep going. All right, give me, what do you got? You got dictionary? Miriam? You got Miriam's? All right. Control game by enforcing obedience and order. Uh, we're going to, fo to focus on B and C, though, for the purpose of the class, all right? Orderly or prescribed conduct or pattern of behavior, self-control, right? Because discipline, as we'll bring it out, really means that self-discipline, right? So a lot of times we think discipline and it's like discipline your kids, right? Punishment, uh, 
bow, bow, whatever it is, all right? Um, but really, as we bring it out in the context of the, strict, the scriptures, none of this would mean anything if we did not have the orderly and prescribed conduct, and especially this part here where it says prescribed conduct. Because we're going to jump right into it when we read the scriptures right now, all right? Or pattern of behavior, because discipline, we're all disciplined in something, right? You can be disciplined in being a reprobate. You could be disciplined in your, uh, in your hustle, right? You could be disciplined in a drug. Hey, you, right, you, you, you discipline as hell. You make sure that you, and, and it could be from weed to more serious stuff. I make sure... I buy two bags every week. I smoke on Thursday and I smoke on Thursday and Saturday because you know uh, I, I don't gotta. I want to make sure I'm all right for work. Like you'll set a whole routine around it just to be able to be disciplined with that. But then we come into this walk and we try to give you just a little bit of order and discipline to teach you how to conduct yourself in this type of environment. And all of a sudden, that self-discipline go out the window. Some of you are disciplined as hell for your TV shows, for your meals, for whatever it might be. For whatever it might be. Hey, some make sure they got a six-pack every day in their house. Yes. Yes. No, no, I'm serious. I, I was one of them years, many years ago. I had to always have a six-pack. Some of you, And what does that lead to? Drunkenness. Right. Right. It so, always leads to sin. Right. And, and I'm going to show you how that lack of discipline uh, ultimately... Because what Cap said, what the end result of that is destruction. So it ultimately will lead to destruction if you don't obtain the Holy Spirit of discipline. All right, so let's start in Wisdom of Solomon 1, and let's go to verse 3. The book of Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 1 and verse 3. For forward thoughts separate from God. Forward thoughts separate from God. While, while I break down the scripture, I'm sorry, I should have given you forward too. Look up forward real quick, all right? Forward thoughts separate from God, come on. And his power, when it is tried, reproveth the unwise. So we're going to go over what discipline is biblically. We're also going to give a few examples of um, what it is to be undisciplined in the scriptures, all right? And we're going to show you how the scripture teaches us to obtain discipline, all right? And one of the things that you have to look at, let me know when you got forward up, is understanding that discipline, in order for it to be applied in any other area of your life, first needs to be applied in these scriptures. It first needs to be applied in bringing, uh, like Paul says, which I might cut that part out for, t for time and just paraphrase it. When Paul in Romans 7 says, that which I do, I do not, and the law showing me what's wrong inside of me, right? Discipline helps you bring into subjection those things that are contrary, right? And like we just brought out, you're disciplined regardless. It's just are you disciplined in holiness or are you disciplined in evil? Are you disciplined in unrighteousness? Are you disciplined in trivial things that won't uh, help you obtain salvation? Let's get forward. Difficult to deal with, contrary, all right? The key part I want with that is contrary. And let's look at some of those synonyms. It says stubborn, headstrong, willful, unyielding. I want to focus on those two, willful and unyielding. It says forward thoughts separate from God. Willful and unyielding. You don't want to let go of those things that the scripture shows you you have wrong in you. You make excuses for your behaviors. You make justifications for your lack of progress and development. And sometimes those justifications are pointed outward and they're deflected. And you're blaming others for those. Let me tell you, that's the weakest form of, of uh, deflection that you could put out there. Blaming someone else for your deficiencies. That's, that's, that's a level of a lack of accountability that's... Uh, magnified and it's a lot harder to deal with somebody like that right self-willed was another one yeah so meaning you have to be in subjection to this and it starts with this it starts with the scriptures and 
not trying to make a way. See, every denomination of religion that's out there, they were willful and unyielding to what the scriptures really said. And rightly so, because most of them were made by Edom, and these scriptures aren't for them. But the reason they've also become so popularized is because, right, you look in these Christian churches, our people uh, make up the bulk of that stuff. I mean, if you look globally, right, yes, there's a lot of Edomite Christians here, right? Um, even counting Catholicism, if you look globally, dealing where Israel's scattered and where Israel is, Christianity is typically, it's not Islam, it's not Buddhism, right? Christianity is the number one religion for most of our people. And why? It makes sense because Christianity allows you to be undisciplined. Christianity allows you to retain that unyielding, that willful self. And this is why those of us who are out there teaching on the streets, you see the rebellion in our people when you bring this stuff out because they have froward thoughts, right? Read that verse again. The Book of Wisdom of Solomon, 1 verse 3. For froward thoughts separate from God and his power when it is tried reprove it the unwise. See, but your hands are too, your arms are too short to box with God. So when you try it, is when you try to go against what he says. And he'll show you what'll happen to yourself. He'll show you what'll happen to you. So he says, if you try it, it, it reproveth the unwise. Read on. For in say malicious soul, wisdom shall not enter. See, everybody's trying to get their precept game up. Everybody wants to sit here. Knowledge puffeth up. It certainly do. Like, if you didn't know how to fight, and you learned how to fight, and you didn't pick up discipline, humility along the way, what do you become a bully? Because you know stuff that other people don't and you can handle people, right? <laughs> right, you're gonna wind up getting killed because one day you're gonna come against something that you can't deal with. But you become a bully first, right? Same thing with any type of knowledge that comes your way. It puffeth up. You start to feel powerful amongst people because you know something that they don't. And but without the other elements that are there, right, to guide you properly in humility and discipline, you go bad, right? So what do they say? Uh, uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? That's a cliche saying in the world. And this is what a lot of people don't understand when the scriptures, when we talk about rulership and stuff, we ain't ruling with our Negro mindset. That's each and every one of us. I'm gonna tell you that right now, because even as good as some of us may be continually working to be, we still are not ready for rulership. There's another step, another changing that has to happen before we'll be set and ready to rule the nations and rule the earth, right? Properly. Read that verse again. For into a malicious soul, wisdom shall not enter. It will not enter. So it's not really wisdom if you have a malicious soul. That's the point that I'm making as I bring that out. That's malice. Knowledge puffeth up, and without discipline, you wind up with a malicious spirit. You try to manipulate scriptures. You try to use what you know to rule and dominate over people. Case in point, how did the split happen? Right. Did not Jeroboam know? Rehoboam know the scriptures? Right? Solomon's son, right? He had knowledge. He had enough knowledge that he went to the elders first, which is what you should do, the men that were in this troop before him, to ask for counsel. But no, his maliciousness decided to go with what the younger cats mm -hmm. told him. And how did that end up? Not good. Although that was prophecy, it had to happen. But you don't know that at that time, it's, right? It's still an example, exactly. He didn't know that. No. Right, yeah. We found that out that it was prophecy after the fact, right? right? So right. that that thing was of God. And that goes into the lack of discipline that he had. Because that means he went to the elders just to check off the list. When he heard his younger uh, peers and his itching ears were scratched by them, he said, okay. See, discipline, even though he didn't like what the elders said, would have made that wisdom shine and say, even though I feel like I should be like this, right? So he was willful and unyielding, so he went with what they said, right? So he already knew what he was going to do. And that's how a lot of y'all come up sometimes for, like, advice and things like that. You already know what you're going to do. You come up for counsel and things like that, and you just want to say, well, I took counsel, right? No, no, you know what? No, hold on. 
Because then y'all try to flip it on us. Oh, well, leadership said, nah, leadership may say, hmm, we didn't say anything. Y'all took it upon yourself because in your heart of hearts, y'all wanted to do what y'all wanted to do. All right? So we don't ever want to hear that BS because that's all that is is BS. All right? At the end of the day, y'all got to live with y'all decision. All we could do is tell you what the scriptures say. Y'all got to live with that decision. All right? All right. Yeah, that, that's a cop out. Y'all got to get that out your mouth that leadership said because if leadership's speaking to you, we're speaking as the oracles of God. We're going to give you what the scriptures say as far as advice. It don't mean I may even read a scripture, but the advice is going to be based off of the scriptures when you're giving counsel or advice. So what you're saying is you don't understand the scriptures when you say leadership said, right? And uh, you don't believe the scriptures either. Because if you did, then you'd realize that what's coming out of our mouth is going to be what's coming from here. And what happens is instead of taking the uh, counsel and advice that you got and meditating on it, you're willful, you're unyielding, you still have what your thoughts are in your head, so you don't open that up, right? Hey, and you can pray for that thing, right? We just read in Psalms 139 how he, he, David was asking the Most High, search me out, find out if there's any wicked way in me, right? Most high, show me, may open me up, let me let subvert my own understanding and show me what this counsel means. So uh, read the verse again. For into a malicious soul, wisdom shall not enter, nor dwell in the body that is subject unto sin. Ah, so here's a heavy point. If it does enter in a state where you're not malicious, right? Because we're never, remember, repentance is a journey, right? Not a destination which means we're all susceptible to the wiles of the devil, right? We're all susceptible to get un, uh, evil spirits on us at any given time. So even if you had wisdom at one time, wisdom doesn't like to say in a house that's like that. So like you read in the New Testament where Christ says about the unclean spirit, right? And it says if you, it, you put it away and it comes back with seven more, and if it finds the place clean and swept, meaning it finds your mind, your soul, uh, clean and swept, meaning you didn't replace it with proper things, things of knowledge, things of holiness, right? It says it comes in with seven more and it's harder to get it out. So the example I used when I was doing the class, let's say wisdom's a person that comes to your house. Your house is your mind, your soul, right? You invite them in. Wisdom is the type of person that's going to be checking the baseboards, going into every room, right? Checking the ceiling. Did you dust here? He's going to open the door, see if there's any skeletons in the closet, right? It wants to see what's there. And if it finds it, your soul, your mind, in the right frame of mind, it'll have a seat on your couch, right? And it'll stay there until you lose that discipline. And it says here, it will not dwell in a body that is subject unto sin. So when it starts to see stuff going on that it don't like, uh, what did I say? You seen the SpongeBob meme? It says, all right, I'm out. Wisdom does that. When it starts to see sin enter, when it starts to see uh, uh, undisciplined behavior, he gets up off that couch and says, all right, I'm out. And it leaves you. And it leaves you. Right? And you have from when it gets up until it gets to the door to try to get yourself in the right frame of mind before it walks out and your state is worse. And then you're running after the car. And at that point, it's hard to recover from something like that. Right. It's hard to recover from something like that. Once, he, once wisdom puts the pedal to the metal, right, that's it. That's wisdom when, when he sees undisciplined, sinful behavior. All right, I'm going to head out. <laughs> right. So don't think because you get it in that that's it. That's where discipline comes in to retain that wisdom. All right. Solomon was the wisest man of all. <laughs> That's it. I know what you're saying, but <laughs> they don't. They don't know the history. Some of them don't know that Solomon went off. Yet he went off. Yeah, he went off. Right. What? Oh, he knew the elements. He knew what the missing element of fire. He knew everything. He knows how the earth. Everything. Everything that we that we that, that we that some of us. I ask and wonder about, he ran you the answer to that. Right. Yet he still went off. 
still went off. He understood. Ready for this? There's one of a thousand men that you could trust, but no women. He understood that. And I'm not saying it for any reason than what it is. It's mm-hmm. the scriptures. Mm-hmm. It's reality. Right. And I don't mean, sister, that don't mean none right. of y'all are not righteous not, and not right. good. God, I, really, I, I felt it. But who's your mother? Yeah. Who's exorcist. your mom's? <laughs> so that's what Solomon is really talking about. That he understood that Eve was your foremother. So don't mean that sisters can't get right and can't be right. And you are going to get right. That's what the kingdom, we're going right. to get right. But right. we ain't right. Right. Well, some of y'all are going to get right. I'm trying to be optimistic. I'm trying to gain them back. No, we gain them back like that. <laughs> but, you know, we gain them back. Some of y'all are going are gonna to be right. Come on, read on. Verse 5. For the Holy Spirit of discipline will flee deceit. Right. You could try to, you might be able to fool others. You might be able to even fool us for a time, right? You can even fool yourself. That Holy Spirit of discipline, it is it, like its radar is lined up to detect BS. And that's why it'll flee. So some of you, when we say you can't get right, what you're really lacking is the Holy Spirit of discipline. So when we say you can't get right, that's a time for introspection, like they say, where you need to go ahead and say, man, let me really analyze myself from where I'm off and start and stop exalting myself that I'm good. I was reading Luke this morning as part of my four chapters uh, in Luke 18 and where it talks about the, the Pharisee and the, and the publican that were praying and the Pharisees like I fast two times a week, I this, that. And it's not that those things are bad. The problem in that example is that he was not being introspective to, to look at his fault. And some of y'all, when we tell you you can't get right, that's what you run to. But I do this and I contribute this and I do that. How you saying I'm off? And then your response is, it's just hot dogs. Those who know, that's the inside joke. You know what I'm talking about. That's someone who was being like that Pharisee in Luke 18, right? Whereas the publican was like, man, I'm not worthy. I'm, I'm a sinner. I know that I'm off. So really it needs to be, hey, let me reflect on myself because the Holy Spirit of discipline will flee deceit. Come on. And remove from thoughts that are without understanding. And it's not going, like, so some of y'all make no sense. Some of y'all are simple as hell. You have some simple thoughts. And that's why we also be like, we're done. We're not talking to you with, with those type of statements. Come back when you write, and then we'll deal with you. Discipline is the same way. It removes from thoughts without understanding. It says, all right, I'm going to head out. <laughs> Here's nonsense. I'm going to head out. Read on. And will not abide when unrighteousness cometh in. It don't want to stay there. It don't want to stay there. Say, like, oh, here we go. Drama. Let me get the heck out of here. So discipline guides us. It is a Holy Spirit. So in order to understand when we say it's a Holy Spirit, right? Because a lot of us coming out of Christianity, it's not when they sprinkled you with the water and you went. Phew. You know, I used to buy into that BS. I remember one time, man, they came out the priest. He was sprinkling the water. I was like, oh, wow, that felt extra refreshing today. It's probably because I was hot and it was real cold, right, you know? And then the churches, right, they're like, you know, the, the, the Catholic churches, the way they're made. Well, we were at the, where we, the, the church, like in our parish, was like an old church. Like it was all stonework and all that stuff. So, yeah, heavy wooden doors and all that stuff, right, you know. So... So meaning like it, there, there, was, there, was, there was a kind of cool in the air. So when that water was sprinkled on you, you'd be like. <laughs> as you're looking at all the idols around you, not even realizing that you're in the midst of. I, ain't, ain't that a. See, see how reprobate we could be because we were all once in that. Right. And maybe not Catholicism, but whatever it was that you were into. Man, I told you before, I was an altar boy. I remember I found all my, I was cleaning out papers. I found all my little altar boy awards and all this other stuff. And I, I showed them to Bishop one time. I said, look, man, look, I was in the midst of this stuff. I said, check this thing out. All that stuff buying into that. All that. Um, it's not that, it doesn't stay. It's not that type of thing. When unrighteousness comes in, it doesn't buy. So we need to understand what holy is. Let's get Romans 7 and 12. We're going to come back to wisdom. Remember ringing the bells? You have to ring the bell when 
when they did their version of break, yeah, everybody wanted to ring the bell. So like the Ultra Boys, like now nah, it's my turn to ring the bell. So it was like one, two, three. It was like five bells, like in a in a little thing, right? Uh, if somebody wants to look it up, so you can show it, the yep. the, the, the Catholic bells, maybe it'll show up. And uh, it used to ring the bell, right. take you, the Eucharist. You were like the senior dude if you rang right, the bell. right, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. And then you know me, I would ring that thing real hard. I was just evil like that, man. I, just, <laughs> I start making a beat. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then, and then you were I'm serious, man. I used no, and they don't like that, you know. So, you, so, so, so if you were in the then. Christian church and you had the bell, you could yeah, do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like a Protestant church yeah, yeah. or something, you could do that, right? <laughs> I I remember when I switched to Protestantism, I liked it because they had like electric guitars and stuff. I said, "Oh, this is way better than." I said, "Catholicism's dry as hell." I said, "This, yeah, this is, was ancient, man." Right. Let me see. No, ours was the ours was more than that. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there the it one is. On, the one on the left. The left, the left. That was it. Yeah, yeah, Those were the altar it. bells all the way. The and then you try to be cool with it. You do like this. Right. And then, you know, and then it had like the, the granite fence. floors in the church, right? <laughs> so you would finish it. Ding, 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 ding. That, ah, look at that. Uh, ah. Look at that. And then you would put the bell down. Yeah. And then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and you ring it extra long, the priest look at you with the right, corner of your right. eye like, yo, I'm like trying this, to finish this like... stuff, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, because he would hold up, because he had like a bigger Eucharist, and then everybody had like a little one that was like bite-sized, and then he would break it and hold it up while you rang the bells. He would hold it up while you rang the bells, so if you, you know, if you... Cookie. It, yeah, he had the cookie in the The yeah, cookie, yeah, so yeah, if you're yeah, holding yeah, the cookie yeah. up... <laughs> And you ringing the bell, he can't put it down, so you're done right. with the bell. So he would look right. at you like he look at you like, yeah, you do that, and then he give you a talking to afterwards. After, yep, he pull you in the side. Give yeah, you a that's when you to. stay ten feet away from him. But that was the why. bells. That was the bells. <laughs> None of that stuff is holy. That's all BS. All right, that's the point. I bring it. I know it took us on a on a journey there. Let's read Romans seven and twelve so we can understand what holy is. The Book of Romans, chapter seven and verse twelve. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy. And just and good. The law and the commandment is what holiness is. The law is the manifestation of holiness. The commandment is the manifestation of holiness. Meaning, it's the embodiment of what holiness is. So if you want to show yourself, show yourself forth as holy, it's not a feeling, it's not a vibe, it's applications of the law. And that's what makes you holy. That's what makes you sanctified. That's what makes you be able to receive the Holy Spirit of discipline. This is why it says with sin, it goes out the door. Because right? discipline and wisdom, they're, they're tied together. You cannot retain wisdom without discipline. Wisdom will be fleeting. So you need the discipline along with the wisdom. That's why when you read Psalms 111 and 10, it says the fear is the beginning and the good understanding is them that do it because of the holiness of the laws lets discipline reside in you to retain that understanding. And it opens up more and more as you do it. So there's a process here in that walk. And one of the most important things that we can all do to service ourselves, the nation, and the most high in Christ better is acknowledge that it's fleeting because we're carnal. Meaning, just because you have it now, in a moment, in a time, just because you have awareness of something, is not the same thing as being disciplined, as being in a holy state of mind always. We cannot take the fact that we know something and mistake that for that we're good, that we have it, and that we're uh, in a position where our salvation is secured. It's not. That's what I mean by it's fleeting. It can, it can leave your grasp at any moment. So we, we ought not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. So therefore, discipline is known and perfected by the keeping of the law. And if you can get this right, you'll then be able, it'll be easy for you to apply discipline in your job. So you're not always late. You're not always leaving, rushing out the, what a horrible feeling it is to have to skip breakfast, leave stuff behind. I've been there. I've been there. See, sister laughing over there. She know. We know. We Right? I got you, sis. I got you. I be like that sometimes. Right? My wife be on it sometimes, too. You you do. You do. She good. She got her, she got her routine down, how she do it. But rather than just say, hey, let me be disciplined enough to go to bed earlier, to wake up earlier, and do what I need to do so that I'm not leaving all rushing and crazy and... 
so on and so forth. Yeah, right. <laughs> Sock and dead. That's real bad. Sock in the sandwich. <laughs> Tur turkey on your foot. <laughs> like, what's that smell? Why, why, why my sock wet? <laughs> It's the, it's the, why am I saying what you're in the sock with? You, you did it all backwards, right? You'll be able to apply it to, the, to that. You'll be able to apply the discipline to your health. You'll be able to apply the discipline in your family. You'll be able to apply that in every aspect of your life if you focus on this part of it first. And guess what? Most of us are already in that process because you're here. You're wearing your fringes, you're keeping the Sabbath day, right? You're trying to deal with these scriptures when things come up in your life and in the body with other people. So you're already doing it. So if you can just master it, and mastering it also means knowing when it's starting to be fleeting in you, then it'll be easy to apply it anywhere else. We put those obstacles in those other areas to make it difficult for ourselves. But if you focus on this Holy Spirit of discipline in this way first, everything else will be fine, as it should be. But it's not. That means it needs to. So guess what? If you're having trouble finding discipline in those things that I mentioned, health, work, um, whatever, exercise, whatever it might be, all right, your household, then that means you need to go back and are you really doing the best you can with discipline as far as the application of the commandments and find that out and fix that, and then it'll be easier for you to apply it in other things. Let's go back to wisdom and read verse 5 again. Book of Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 1 and verse 5. For the Holy Spirit of discipline will flee deceit and remove from thoughts that are without understanding and will not abide when unrighteousness cometh in. Come on. For wisdom is a loving spirit. Wisdom is a loving spirit, and it's going to explain what that love is. Because, again, we're all coming out of Christianity. You saw me and Cap were ringing bells, all right, <laughs> dressed in robes and frocks and all that stuff, all right? We did, right? The black with the white over it. Oh, no, that was if you were the head altar boy. I never wore red and white. They gave me, they gave me black and white. What? <laughs> you, 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 you attained much higher rank than me in the altar boy service. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead it's a loving spirit it's going to explain what that love is right come on and will not acquit a blasphemer of his word ah so that's a loving spirit what's a blasphemer contrary to the scriptures right it says it won't acquit them of their words meaning it's going to show you that you're off it's going to show you that you're not right this is also a good example of how we should behave with each other you want to roll in the Holy Spirit of discipline, that means you don't acquit a blasphemer of his words. You hold each other accountable and yourself. That's love. Read. For God is witness of his reigns and a true beholder of his heart and a hearer of his tongue. So discipline doesn't let you, doesn't let that uh, justification talk, that contingency talk creep in. It tells you that you're full of crap. You're full of SH. That's the Holy Spirit of discipline. So God knows and will not acquit. So we ourselves should hold ourselves to this same standard. Let's get Philippians 2 and 12. If that's, if that's how God rolls, if that's how the Holy Spirit of discipline rolls. The book of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now, much more in my absence. Why in the absence? Because it's easy to have somebody outside always telling you what to do, right? But when you're on your own, that's when discipline needs to take over. Discipline needs to reign in your members. It's easy when you have somebody else. So, for example, if you have a trainer for the gym, you he's going to push you when he sees you being slack. You could go by yourself and pumping out substandard sets, right? You could go there playing around like Isaac's been doing for like a year. That's why you got no gains. <laughs> He's buffed. I saw your back. I saw your back when you were getting acupuncture. You got nothing on your back. It's like this table. I, hey, I'm not acquitting you, bro. I'm not acquitting you, right? 
he got he got a little he got a little bicep peak going, so he he fears that's it. I told him the other day. I said, I said, bro, what's wrong with you? Is oh, you only work out arms? I said, what are you doing over there? What's what's going on? So with a trainer, right? That's not gonna happen. They're gonna look at you. They're gonna say, you you know, yeah, you're doing this wrong. Your form is off. Come on, stop halfway doing it, right? And they'll motivate you. Uh, same thing with diet. If you have somebody there to kind of watch over your shoulder, you'll be like, you sure you want to eat that cookie? Right? If you have somebody there that pop up all the time, right? You'll be all right. Hey, it's kind of like them, you seen them uh, videos online where you got the big buff dude come up to the guy eating a hot dog and smack the damn hot dog out of his hand. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Some people need that. But the true measure of discipline is when not in their presence only. Read this verse again. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only. Right, it's easy to obey when your overseers are there and people are going to call you out. It's when you're by yourself that you have to realize this, right? And like I said, if the Holy Spirit of discipline, like we read in wisdom, won't acquit you, it's a loving spirit, then we need to be that way too. Our mind should be in the mind of the way that spirit and the most high operates. Come on. But now, much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because there's nothing else there left for you. You need to grow up into that self-discipline and that Holy Spirit of discipline to be able to maintain and behave and operate the way you need to in the absence of those overseers, of those coaches. You're going to say something? You know what else is discipline at a micro level? Knowing that you need discipline. Knowing yeah. that you need discipline is half the battle. Because what will you do knowing that you need discipline? You will surround yourself around this work, around this truth, around brethren. Okay? There's a brother here. I'm not going to mention his name, but he, 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 he's struggling with stuff. And he, rec he makes sure that he's been around, okay, stuff dealing with the body. All right? It's a start. Now, again, at some point, you got to go to sleep. At some point, you got to be alone by yourself. Yep. But guess what? Why, why make things – why make your battle – Harder by not surrounding yourself around this Bible. And the Bible says surround yourself around your brethren or of your sister around your sisters. Right. Remember, that's what the unity of brethren is really about. That's right. what makes it. That's why it's, an, right. it's like the ointment. It's like the do of Ramon, because you'll get that environment and that vibe that will help you with that. But like we're reading in Philippians, it says not in my presence only. Read on. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Right, meaning he wants to give you the wisdom. He wants to keep the Holy Spirit. See, Holy Spirit of discipline, even though he might get up out of there in the car, he come back and he parks in the front and he's just waiting for you to invite him back in. Right? So he's just checking to see if it's ready for me to come back in. Are you ready to receive me and do what you need to do? Because God is there and he wants to will you to do good. Let's get Job 36 and 10. But you got to be able to take that accountability. Job 36 and 10. The book of Job chapter 36 and verse 10. He openeth also their ear to discipline. And commanded that they return from iniquity. So this explains what we read in Philippians 2 and 13. Read that again real quick and then come back and read Job again. The book of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. For it is good which, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Right, so how does he do that? Read Job 36 and 10. Job 36 and 10. He openeth also their ear to discipline. It's there. Like I said, he's parked outside your house. Waiting to see if he can come back in. Come on. And commanded that they return from iniquity. And that's that accountability part. And commanded that they return from iniquity. You have to be able to realize that there's something lacking so that you can then say, okay, let me get rid of this thing. Damn, why did discipline leave? Oh, man, I had a dead rat under the couch. And that dead rat could be your, your lust. It could be your alcoholism. It could be whatever it is that's contrary to the to the scriptures, right? And he's going to say, get that thing out of here. Get it out of here. And then, oh, okay. Hey, discipline, come back in. All right? And you move forward in that. And you move forward in that. God is set up that way with us. Let's get Proverbs 11 and 3. Watch this.
the book of Proverbs, chapter 11 and verse 3. The integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. Mm. So I'm going to now show you, we're going to bring up the definition of integrity. I'm going to show you in this verse how you can guide yourself without having, see, because one measure, like Cap said, at some point you got to go to sleep. One measure is be around brethren, right? Be around people that are in this. I don't know, man. Some of y'all, I don't think you, you get it yet when the scripture says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, right? Um, about being unequally yoked. Some of you allow your children to, the term having uh, worldly friends should set up all types of red flags in your spirit that you allow them to have worldly friends. I get when they go to school, you're not there, right? You're not there over their shoulder. And you, and it's school, right? You know how kids are, so you can't have them be the antisocial and stuff like that. So we have to teach them how to maintain their integrity and their tr faithfulness to God in Christ, but also be able to function in the world, right? So I tell my daughter, hey, those are school friends. And by school friends, that means not after school, that means not before school. Those are people that you acquaint with in school. That means no text message. Y'all shouldn't be on Roblox together or whatever it is you're playing in the chat. Your relationship starts and ends in the classroom. And that's the end of it. And I'm okay with that because guess what? That's all right because they're going to have to work a job where there's other people. They're going to go to a college where there's other people. They're going to be in those environments. So you start them from their youth. Uh, listen, my daughter's been asking me for a phone for the longest. I said, why? You're always with us. Maybe if you were a latchkey kid, right? Uh, yeah, you need a phone. You're always with us. Why do you need a phone? Oh, well, I want it for this, that, and I said, nah, that's going to open you up to text messages and phone calls from these worldly friends. Nope. I said, you know, you know when you can have a phone? Yeah. If you ask my daughter, when did your dad say you can have a phone? She's going to tell you when I'm 18. And that's maybe. <laughs> and that's maybe, all right? No, 18, all right? Because then at that point, right, she's, she's nearing that point where... She's going to have to make her decisions, right? She may be staying with me for a little longer after that. We'll see what the, we don't know what the future holds, right? But um, the point is we have to be able to teach ourselves these things, right? And maintain that level of integrity to guide us. Even those of us that are coming out of this walk uh, 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 in the world, coming into righteousness, we have to decondition ourselves from the way that we operated. So it's amazing to me how we could still have Friends, when Christ said make friends of the mammon, he clearly tells you it's for useful purposes, right? If you need a solid, there's a connect that can get you this, that, whether it be something as simple as a discount or a hook up at a job, right? But outside of that, why are you interacting with people like that, right? So you get yourself around proper people, but then you also need to put yourself in a frame of mind where you have the integrity to maintain yourself not in my presence only, like Paul said, right? So let's look up integrity. The quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. Honest with who? Yourself. In the context of what we're bringing out, being honest with yourself and have strong moral principles. Where do we find morality as Israelites? In the Bible. Does somebody got a scripture for me? Any scripture. I'm not saying there's a right or wrong one. Well, go ahead. That's, I got one that I think of when I think of that. More, the moral principles. Uh, Job 31 and 1. I made a covenant with my eyes. Is, is that yeah, that's 31? good. That's all right. That's okay. That's good. What else? Anybody else? Uh, Caleb. Soldier Caleb. Uh, Philippians 2 and 12. Philippians 2 and 12. We just brought out. That's a good one. What about in Deuteronomy where he says, this is your wisdom in the sight of the nations. Keep therefore and do them, and they'll say you're such a wise. Wise because why? Scientific devices? Because we, we make in iPhones and televisions? No, because of the moral principles that we stand for as a people. That God gave that morality to us, and only us. So let's look at another definition of integrity. You have Miriam Webster? Oh, wait, go back. I saw a word I like there. Nobility is a similitude for integrity, honor, ethics, morals, righteousness. 
righteousness. We're dealing with the commandments, right? So right, it will be our righteousness if we keep all these commandments, right? It shall be our righteousness. Where do you find righteousness? On the priest's lips, right? What did the priest teach? The laws. So the integrity is dealing. Remember, we're still dealing with the holy. We're still dealing with uh, the integrity aspect and how discipline starts with that. And once you've mastered and acknowledged that, then discipline will be able to be applied to every other aspect of your life. Go back to the definitions. Go to the other ones. Firm adherence to a code of especially moral or artistic values. Look at that. Incorruptibility. Incorruptibility. Look, look at the second one. An unimpaired condition. Soundness. You know what else that's saying? Sober-minded. The Bible calls that sober-minded. The quality or state of being complete or undivided. Not double-minded, right? Because if you're double-minded, you're unstable in all your ways. So uh, you have Webster. Let's see what Webster said. Oh, that is Webster? Okay, then that's good. Right, let's go back to Proverbs 11. The book of Proverbs, chapter 11 and verse 3. The integrity of the upright shall guide them. That integrity, now understanding that uh, definition, your moral principles, your code. Like Christ say, this is the way. I think I mentioned it before, the, the Mandalorian, that whole thing. He says, this is the way, right? Christ says, this is the way, walk ye in it. That integrity will guide you so that not in my presence only, not in the presence of the brethren or the overseers that will tell you that you're right and wrong, you'll be able to have your own so-called moral compass, like it speaks about, and be able to make intelligent spiritual decisions on how you guide your day-to-day. But then it also says, read on. But the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. So now we have to understand what perverse means, right? So let's pull up the definition of perverse. Because it says the perverseness of transgressors. So he's telling you. He's giving you the secret to maintain your integrity. Don't be unstable. Don't be divided. Have that nobility, that righteousness. What was the other one you said you saw? The, the similar word? Honor. Honor. Perverse of a person or their actions showing a deliberate and obstinate desire to behave in a way that is unreasonable or unacceptable, often in spite of the consequences. If that is not an Israelite with a Negro state of mind, I don't know what is. We need pictures of like all of us next to that definition because that's us in the current state that we're in. Bring the definition back up. Leave it up there. Leave it up there. It says deliberate and obstinate desire to behave in a way that is unreasonable. And unreasonable. That's why sometimes you hear something about a brother or sister. You'd be like, what? No way. What the hell were they thinking? Or you'll hear us say behavior unbecoming because they behaved in a way that was deliberate or obstinate, right? That is unreasonable or unacceptable. It's unreasonable or unacceptable because the Bible tells us that. Right. Yeah, willful, self-will, all, th all these words have synergy. Right. Contrary, uh, obstructive, troublesome, annoying, vexatious. Ooh, that's a good one. I'm Because you know I will say, damn, that person vexed me. The way he did vex me. I'm going to start calling y'all, man, you a vexatious brother. You're contrarious. Look at you. Contumacious. Damn, what the hell does that mean? I know it means similar to that. Click on contumacious. Down. Next to contrarious. It's next to contrarious. Bullheaded. Oh, you thought it said BS? Bloody-minded. Hey, I like that. You know why? What we just read. Transgressors, their perverseness will destroy them. That means your mindset is on death. The wages of sin is death. Go ahead. Click that. I'm just curious. Contumacious. Archaic, stubbornly or willfully disobedient to authority, contumacious. Hey, and that sounds like a that sounds like an old Greek name. I could think I could think of several brothers. I'm gonna call him Contumacious the first, the second, the third, the fourth. Contumacious Junior. That but I'm, I'm gonna write that down. Contum I'm serious. That's gonna be the new nickname for some of y'all. Contumacious. 
And if there's more than one, I'm just going to, the first, the second, the third, all of that. That's it. I found a new one that I like. Read Proverbs 11 and 3 again. And then I get me to uh, Miriam's. The book of Proverbs, chapter 11 and verse 3. <laughs> the integrity of the upright shall guide them. But the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. Right, so we're dealing with that perverseness. Turned away from what is right or good. Corrupt, that's perverseness. Improper, incorrect. Contrary to the evidence or the direction of the judge on a point of law. Is that not the commandments? That's the commandments. Look, and look at how perverseness arises. It arises from or it's indicative of stubbornness or obstinacy. Bullheaded. Evidence is the scriptures and then the direction of the counsel. Right. Right. That's right. The evidence is the scriptures and the direction is the counsel that you're given in those things. But you but you go contrary to it. You go contrary to all that's there. And you know why this still has to deal with discipline? Because di let's pull up the definition of discipline again. Because people are you know, we people, we, we have short attention spans. It's not a Marvel movie. Or, or sports. Control gained by enforcing obedience to order. Right? Self-control. Orderly or prescribed conduct or pattern of behavior. So when you see the contrary... Because what, what perverseness is telling you and what makes it perverse, when you say, gosh, someone did what was perverse, is that they knew it was wrong. They knew it was wrong and they did it anyway. So they lacked the discipline. Bring up the definition again. I know you guys are out of practice. They lacked the control to enforce the obedience of their own spirit to mortify their members into what is right. That's what that's going into. All praise is that we have Christ for that thing, because under the old covenant, lack of discipline would mean death. Under the new covenant, we have a chance to fix that and get it correct. Read Proverbs 11 and 3 one more time. The book of Proverbs, chapter 11 and verse 3. The integrity of the upright shall guide them. Keep your integrity. It will guide you. Come on. But the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. So be honest with yourself. And it will guide you. But if you want to be obstinate or stubborn and go against it, it can lead to your destruction if you don't repent of it. Let's get Wisdom of Solomon 6 and 17. The book of Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 17. For the very true beginning of her is the desire of discipline. Right, so wisdom. He's talking about wisdom here. He says the very true beginning of her is the desire of discipline. See, all of us like the way the discipline sounds. All of us will have a desire for it. But once it's there, we don't like it because it puts hard choices in front of you. It forces you to be terribly honest with yourself and not just have to look at that honesty, but then have to take action on it. And that's tough. You know how they say the truth hurts, right? That's a saying in the world, the truth hurts. There ain't a harder truth that you're going to hear than from your own self to accept that, right? Because the world has taught you that you're perfect just the way you are, right? You were born this way. <laughs> you're perfect. There's nothing wrong with you, right? But when it comes to this walk, we need to be able to take honest assessments with ourselves daily. That's how you maintain, remember, maintain discipline. Discipline ain't one and done. It ain't you caught it and it's a wrap. It don't go that way. It can leave. It can depart. Read on. And the care of discipline is love. And the care of discipline is love. So uh, read the next verse so we can understand that. And love is the keeping of her law. So if you want to care for the discipline that's entered into your spirit so that discipline doesn't leave, it says keep those laws at all times and discipline will stay with you. Come on. And the giving heed unto her laws is the assurance of incorruption. You will not go perverse. It's the assurance of incorruption. So discipline, we need to look at it as, you know, like when you were in the world and you were dating, right? And you wanted to, you, you know, woo the girl, right? Or impress the guy or whatever it was, right? 
So you bought him flow, you bought her flowers, you took her to a restaurant, whatever it was, right? You put you put on extra nice makeup sisters, you wore your best outfit, whatever it was. Meaning you were not complacent in how you acted because you wanted to get it, right? And in some relationships we realize we want to keep that so you you don't become complacent in that regard either. It's the same thing but spiritually now, right? So what's the flowers? What's the dinner? What's your best outfit? That's that integrity mindset. That's the application of the laws. That's how you impress discipline. That's how you woo discipline to say, come on over, sit on my couch. Stay right here with me. And you embrace that and you maintain it by keeping that integrity of these laws. Don't let yourself walk in perverse ways. It's dealing with integrity and discipline. Come on, read. And incorruption maketh us near unto God. Ooh. And, I, you know, I've been going over the godlike characteristics here and there. And it says this type of behavior leads to incorruption and incorruption make us near to God. Godlike. Godlike. We want immortality. We want to be closer to that Godhead mentality. We need to embrace discipline and keep it with us. It's uh it's like, what did I say? I forgot what example I used when I was teaching the 300 class. But, you know, sometimes you'll have like, um, there'll be games or let's say there's like a collection you want to get for it to be complete, right? To put it all together, right? You need certain elements, right? Okay, so I need this piece here. It makes that. I need this to make that. Or a puzzle, right? I'll use a puzzle. I need, it, it's a specific piece in order to complete the next piece and the next piece and the next piece. Discipline is a foundational piece of that. Discipline is a foundational piece of that, leading to that incorruption, leading to that godhood, that godlike mentality. Let's get 1 Peter 1 and 15. The book of 1 Peter, chapter 1 and verse 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. So in order to be godlike, we must do the things that God commands us and be like him. It says, he who's called us is holy. God and Christ, they're holy. So he says, in everything that we do, we need to be holy. It's another scripture that says, in, in anything that you do, do it with all that might as unto the Lord. So you want some discipline where you don't put the sock in the sandwich and the turkey in the, in the, on the foot? Adopt that mindset. <laughs> Pretend you're going to work for God. And let's see if you really about, that's going to show you if you're really about this walk or you're really about yourself because just a little more slumber, just one more snooze, just, just, uh, just 10 more minutes on the television, just one more episode before I jump on this or do that. And that, and that, and that starts to put a different perspective in your mind. And it may seem trivial. Remember, God sees every single thing with us. We're going to bring out another scripture later that it talks about, especially when it pertains to us. Because God sees everything, but especially when it pertains to us. Us being his chosen, his eyes are always on us. Always. Always. So put that in your mind and try to roll with that. Read on, verse 16. Verse 16. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Oh, guess what? So it's not a choice is written you need to be holy because i am holy right and uh let's read that real quick a little bit against 11 44 just for context because it said it is written where is it written let's look at it leviticus 11 44 the book of leviticus chapter 11 verse 44 for i am the lord your god ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves and ye shall be holy how do you sanctify yourselves keeping the commandments that's what makes you clean come on for i am holy Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Right. So he was specifically talking about dietary law, but he's letting you know, I am holy, so you need to be holy. I am holy, so you need to be holy. So, so the reason, outside of him just telling us why we can't eat certain foods, is because he wouldn't eat them. He wouldn't deal with those things also. So it's a pattern of holy behavior that he's setting up in us. We, this is boot camp. It's a long boot camp. But it's boot camp preparing us, right, for what comes first, the battle in the wilderness and then the kingdom and rulership. 
It's the rehearsal, like you read, rehearsing the righteous acts. Let's go to Sirach 4 and 17. The book of Sirach, chapter 4 and verse 17. For at the first, she will walk with him by crooked ways. This is he's dealing with wisdom. Remember, wisdom and discipline go together because you, you can have an awareness of wisdom. But for wisdom to reside, discipline has to be there with it. Read it again. For at the for at the first, she will walk with him by crooked ways. Come on and bring fear and dread upon him and torment him with her discipline until she may trust his soul and try him by her laws. That's not a quitting of, of our words. When it says to torment her by the ways, it says it'll torment you with the discipline. So it has to happen this way, right? You have to have an awareness first of what was wrong because many of us were doing things wrong, right? Look, we were talking about dietary law. We were eating pork, shellfish. Man, I'll go into some stuffed lobster tails like nobody's business. That was, that was I, I mean, I didn't love alligator, but I had alligator, right? Yep, I had buffalo alligator. Tastes just like chicken, hot sauce and uh, blue cheese, right? Soft shell crab, all that stuff. I was all in that lump, lump crab stuffed in succulent lobster tail, right? Yeah, y'all know. You remember. Uh, pray none of your mouth is getting salivated right now. You got the devil on you. <laughs> That's perverse, all right? <laughs> Eliezer was like, oh, let me fix myself. <laughs> Papa Do's. <laughs> Papa Do's seafood, right? <laughs> Eliezer was like, it was fire. But that was my, I had my restaurant in, in City Island. Right? Sammy's fish box. Right? They bring out crusty bread with a fresh cheese and all that. Right? You remember that? The salad with the with the I always say this wrong, the giardinia, is that how you say it right? The little pickled vegetables, pickled cauliflower and everything, all that stuff. Right? And then they bring out them lobster tails and all that. I didn't know, right? So there was no discipline to apply there. But then once I knew if somebody throws some lobster tails in front of me, what am I supposed to do? And you know why it's torment in the beginning? Because you're salivating. You remember how it tastes drenched in butter? Right? Because that's how you did it, right? Just all types of melted butter all slapped up in there. Right? That's how, that's how you roll. Discipline. But right, it says at first it does that. Because in the beginning, as you learn what's right and wrong, it's, it's a little difficult for you to put that thing away. Right? Read on. Verse 18. Then will she return the straight way unto him and comfort him and show him her secrets. Right. So it must happen this way. Then you'll have fruit. You, they say this. There's a saying in the world. Discipline is the bridge between goals and success. Right. So we have the kingdom of heaven. That's our goal. Right. And then we're over here on the other side of it. Right. And there's a big gap. Right. And then Christ has come into the picture to make it even feasible that we can try to get to the other side, but discipline must be maintained to get there. So as you increase in knowledge, it's not a torment anymore. You can see the peronine and say, I don't need that, right? You can see the lobster tails and say, I don't need that, right? Or whatever it was that you were into. And you can put that thing away and say, listen, I will never be able to progress farther than I have in this walk if I don't put, and this is why it's a progressive thing. Read uh, verse 18 again. Verse 18. Then will she return the straight way unto him and comfort him and show him her secrets. Why? Because knowledge increases, right? And it's only torment if you don't give into it, right? Verse 17 says she'll torment you with her discipline. But discipline should do that. And if you do feel at certain stages in your walk that there's hard decisions in front of you, then that's a good thing. That means it's doing what it needs to do to purge that out of you. But you must maintain that integrity. You have, a, you have a choice at that point. Am I going to uh, have integrity here? Or am I going to go ahead and be contumacious? The first, second, or third. All right? And it, Isaac's nervous because he's like, damn, he's going to call me contumacious the first. <laughs> Let me <laughs> decontumacious. He's the original. Sirach 17 and 15. The book of Sirach, chapter 17 and verse 15. Their ways are ever before him and shall not be hid from his eyes. Right, so this is talking about 
uh, the most high looking at us. Remember I said his eyes are always on us? It says their ways are ever before him and shall not be hid from his eyes. So when I said you could do that little experiment with yourself where let's say you have a trouble with lateness at the job and you just can't seem to fix it, right? Go ahead and say, man, I, let me put in my mind, I'm going to work for God. And if you still ain't doing that right, you're showing yourself something and you're showing the most high something also, right? So anything that you have struggles with, so now, now I'm starting to give you a little inkling how you take this discipline after you've paramountly applied it to your spirit first, how you can take the same Holy Spirit and start to apply it to other things, right? Because let's be honest, can you control something like tardiness? You absolutely can. It's actually very rare that there's a legitimate reason for you to be that's not somewhere when you committed to be somewhere, right? And what we tend to do as people in general is try to use logic to rationalize and justify our actions rather than just say, where was, because it might be that there, there was some uncontrollable circumstances, but where was the parts where you had some measure of control, right? So maybe you were going to be right on time, which is never really good. You should try to plan to be a little early. Maybe you were going to be right on time, uh, but, you know, uh, you hit some traffic, right? So then you think about it. Well, if I had just got up 15 minutes earlier, then I, right? and, that's, I, and I use that one because that's an easy one to kind of try to piece together. But that same thing you can apply to anything else, right? And God sees that. And he, and he likes that stuff because, you're like, okay, they're trying to take this Holy Spirit and apply it in every area of their life, right? Read on. Uh, verse verse 16. 16, come on. Verse 16. Every man from his youth is given to evil. Neither could they make to themselves fleshly hearts for stony. Right, so again. Integrity is acknowledging that each and every one of us from when we were born is given to evil. Meaning our default is evil. Our default in, in the flesh, in our car, that's what it means we're born in sin, is to be corrupt. That's our default. And if you can understand that and never forget that, no matter how far along you are in this walk, that's going to give you a big leg up to continue to move forward in the right spirit when things come up. The problem is, is when we sit there like that Pharisee that I mentioned in Luke 18 and say, well, I fast twice a week. I do this for the body. I do a lot for the truth. Sure. God sees that. That's fine. That's not going to help you. The stuff that you do good when there's still things that are lacking is not going to help you. And the stuff that you do good, right? So. If, if you're in a particular field, right, or a sport or a job or whatever it is, and you're good at that one thing, should you spend more time on the thing that you're good at or on the thing that you need to get better at to get to the next level? So you got to be able to probe and assess at all times. Remember, I did a whole class about without self-examination, which is a spiritual gift, none of us is going to make it. So we need to be able to assess and do that. Read on. Verse 17. For in the division of the nations of the whole earth, he set a ruler over every people. But Israel is the Lord's portion. Right, so he's letting you know Israel, even though, he, so he gave uh, leaders to all these other nations to show them all their ways. But to us, he said, I am going to deal with you directly. I am going to give you a law. I'm going to let them come up with, so you know how like, uh, Moab and them got Buddhism and uh, the Dalai Lama and all that other stuff, right? Uh, Elam got, uh, what the hell they call that, with Shiva, Krishna and Shiva and all those other people, right? Uh, everybody got their own stuff, right? Levi got uh, voodoo. No, 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 not Levi. Haitians got voodoo, right? You Levi, you're not rolling like that no more, right? Uh, he says, God didn't deal with us like that. He said, them, I'm going to leave them to their own devices. You I'm going to show you my ways. And you and and now I'm going to watch you as I see if you're going to apply those ways. Read on. Whom being his firstborn, he nourisheth with discipline. And one of the first, you know how like babies get milk? He says as the firstborn, what he nourished us first with is discipline. 
And this is why I say discipline, we make it more complicated than what it really is. If you are here today, you've applied discipline to your life. And you continue to apply it daily as you keep showing up in the right spirit. Because some of y'all show up and you got the damn devil on you. And we see it. We just waiting for it to be really manifest, all right? Some of us see it from early. But he nourished us with discipline, meaning that's the foundational nutrition for anything else that we need to receive of the Father. Come on. And giving him the light of his love does not forsake right. him. Right, and the light of his love is these laws. Because he said, you're my portion. I appointed leaders to the other nations to show them how to live. But the light of my love I have here in the form of this holy Bible to you. And taught and given to you by the mouth of the prophets and those who he's chosen to give this thing and break this understanding down. Come on. Therefore, all their works are as the sun before him. Ooh, it says all our works are as the sun before him. I know we got the other one where it says his eyes are 10,000 times brighter. But this one, he says, is because he nourishes us directly. He watches over us. He took us as his first portion. That means every little thing you do is like a ray of sunshine in pitch darkness to him. Uh, I use the example of uh, X-Men, right? Because those of us who were movie night, we saw it. When you go into Cerebro, right, all the people lit up. But then those that were mutants, which are the Israelites, lit up a different color and they shone brighter. That's how I imagine the Most High sees each and every one of us. We stand out in the multitude of his creation. So all our ways are like the sunshine to him. Read it again. Therefore, all their works are as the sun before him, and his eyes are continually upon their ways. So he's always continue. This is why he says every idle word. Always. All our works. You can't, you can't hide it from you can hide it from others. You can even try to hide it from yourself. You can't hide it from the most high. Let's get Sirach 23 and 1. The book of Sirach, chapter 23 and verse 1. O Lord, Father and Governor of all my whole life, leave me not to their counsels and let me not fall by them. So he's talking about the other nations here. He says, God, don't lead me to their counsels, right? Because I can fall by them. Worldly knowledge is polluted. It will not help you. Come on. Who will set scourges over my thoughts? And the discipline of wisdom over my heart. Ah, so remember, I said discipline and wisdom, they go together. The discipline of wisdom. Wisdom is the mother of discipline. So it says the discipline of wisdom. So what he's telling you is, remember how we read discipline will not acquit a blasphemer of his words? It's a loving spirit. He's saying that if you don't leave me to the knowledge of the world, and these other nations, because they're not going to show me my right from wrong. The scourges over my thoughts is what we read earlier when it said, it'll walk with you by crooked ways and torment you with her discipline. Because it shows you the right and the wrong. And if you have the integrity to acknowledge that, it, you should feel bad. You should look at those things and feel shameful for them. If they're not according to what God requires. So he says, who's going to do this? This is a rhetorical question. Because he means they're not going to do it, but I understand God does. Come on. That they spare me not from mine ignorances, and it pass not by my sins. See, God doesn't spare you for your ignorances. Remember, he says in Luke, uh, him who knew will get a few stripes, right? I mean, him who didn't know will get a few stripes, and him who knew will get many. There's another scripture that says, though you wist it not in this life, the commandments, you still are held accountable for them. So you might come across some people that'll be like, oh, well, you know, I'd rather remain ignorant. Don't show me these laws. No, you're ignorant in this life, but you weren't in the one before. You were probably not in the one before that. So this is why he's not going to spare. It's just. But some people are like, damn, why is God going to whip me if I didn't know nothing? At one time you knew. That's why. And you still didn't do it. But he says, no, if it's worse for you, if you knew in this life, you're going to get more if you still didn't do it. So read that whole verse again. Verse two. Verse two. Who will set scourges over my thoughts and the discipline of wisdom over mine heart that they spare me not from mine ignorances and it pass not by my sins. Right. And this was the part where I said, I'm, I'm going to cut it out. But you can reference Romans 7, 13 through 15. Right. 
and then uh, you can go 18 through 21, where Paul's basically saying that the law, he's describing how the law tormented him, how it scourged his thoughts, because he was saying, that which I do, I do not, and what I thought was good, God showed me was not. And he goes into this, what seems like a philosophical conversation, but when you understand discipline, you realize he's not. I'm just taking that piece out for the sake of time, all right? So rock 23 and 2. Uh, oh, you read it again. Read on. Verse 3. Verse 3. Lest mine ignorance is increased, and my sins abound to my destruction, and I fall before mine adversaries, and mine enemy rejoice over me, whose hope is far from thy mercy. So he said, I don't want to lean. I don't want these heathen to show me anything, because they are not going to spare me. They are not going to give me love and scourge my thoughts. They're going to spare me from my ignorances. He goes, and if my ignorances increase, my sins will abound to destruction. That's the perverseness that we read in Proverbs 11 and 3. He says, so if that increases, my sins will abound. I might want to go to this last part in Romans. Let me see here. Still got a few more scriptures. Just trying to cut some stuff out in the middle. Uh, let's go to Romans 7, and I'm going to go from 21 all the way down to 25. The book of Romans, chapter 7 and verse 21. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Right, so he's saying whenever I want to see that there's something off in me, the law shows me where I'm off. So part of that integrity is going into this. Even if you think you know it, you have it memorized, is going into this and say, Man, do I have a spirit of this? Do I have a spirit of that in this particular situation? Come on. I find in the law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Come on. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Read on. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. So he's letting you know. He says, listen, the, the spiritual man, the inward man, right, which is supposed to be modeled after Christ, I delight when I see these things. That's when you hear these scriptures, you all in the spirit. You're like, damn, that's heavy. Let me highlight that. Let me write this down. Damn, facts, whatever it is, right? And then he says, but then I also, what the law shows me is that there's another law, right? And that's the law of this world, the one that won't scourge you, the one that rewards you for your ignorances, right? Read on. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Right. So that's like Galatians 5, 17. Read on. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So you have to understand that this is why I say it's a constant thing. This is why you have to maintain discipline. This is why when we first opened up, it said it'll flee deceit. It will not reside in a soul that is subject unto sin. Come on. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Right, because this is that constant pull that's in us. With our mind, we want to serve the law of God. But when given that opportunity to apply and put it in action, that discipline needs to be in place. Because if not, we don't want to take those steps and move in that direction. Let's go back to Sirach 23 and pick up where we left off. Was it 4? Uh, yeah, I think four. four. Yes, sir. Yep. Go ahead. Sirach chapter 23 and verse 4. O Lord, Father and God of my life, give me not a proud look, but turn away from thy servants always a haughty mind. Right. So these are the things that we got to think about. We want to be able to not have a haughty mind. That goes into that forwardness like we read at the beginning with discipline. Come on. Turn away from me vain hopes and concupiscence, and thou shalt hold him up that is desirous always to serve thee. You know what vain hopes is going into? When your priorities aren't aligned with God's program. Vain hopes are setting up those riches and that stuff in this world, trying to do things based on your desires, not realizing the larger mission, right? And our repentance is a light for the rest of those that have not repented yet. Whether you want it to be or not, just you don't understand just sheer magnitude of every individual adding to the whole gets us a step closer, not only to the kingdom, but for more people of our people that we're looking for seeing the validity. Because we don't need the other nations uh, validity in anything. All we need really is God's. But other people see this as a real thing. We went to a point where they saw us 
on street corners and they said, you guys are probably all ex-cons and criminals with no jobs. And now the breadth of where we're at as the, as the Most High's word has moved in Israel, you have people from all walks of life. We have celebrities who are like the Joseph of Arimatheas, that they're in the background following us and doing stuff. You have people that have come from what's deemed in the world's eyes as professional and esteemed uh, uh, careers with prestige is the word that they would use, right? Lawyers, doctors, high-level executives, uh, uh, skilled musicians, uh, teachers, all types of uh, different backgrounds. That's not what they say we are. And trust me, just by that alone, people see that thing and it changes the flood that they're trying to put out, that we're just this hate group that's unproductive and we don't contribute to society in any way and all this stuff. Your best way to counteract that is not to argue back and forth with those things, but to apply this and let that light shine to the whole world. Remember, I, I said it earlier, Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 4. This is our, well, six and four. It's our wisdom in the, in the sight of the nations. So it says they will look at us and say, this is a wise and understanding people. Where are we at? What verse? Verse six. Go ahead. Verse six. Let not the greediness of the belly nor lust of the flesh take hold of me and give not over me thy servant into an impudent mind. That's like Paul was just saying. I find that there's a war going on in there. So some of the stuff that we should pray about is along this ilk here. Hey, I don't want these things to take over. Don't say that you don't have those things, but rather acknowledge that you need to have the strength to fight those things because all of us have those things, each and every one of us. There ain't a one of us that's walking around up here that doesn't have some, some, some form of a lust, some form of a desire that's contrary to the scriptures. And we got to put it away. Read on. Verse 7. Hear, O ye children, the discipline of the mouth. Yeah, hear the discipline of the mouth. Going into all this that we were just reading. Come on. He that keepeth it shall never be taken in his lips. Meaning you'll maintain that integrity to not speak perverse things. Because when you speak perverse things, those who are in the right spirit and right mind, you, you fall upon, your, your tongue falleth upon itself. And you reveal yourself in things. That's why a lot of times we'll sit up here and we just let... I mean, what, wasn't it just last Sabbath? I feel like, a, feel like an eternity ago. We were dealing with a few issues last Sabbath. And you just letting people speak and you just hear. And, you know, it's not even so much a discerning of spirits, right? Obviously, we know that's a spiritual thing that the Most High gives. But it's just by experience. Those same spirits use the same lines. You understand what I'm saying? So it's like if it's, if it's a lying spirit, I, I'll give you an example. A spirit that's a lying spirit that's backed into a corner and caught in a lie will say, they'll never acknowledge that they lied. They'll either say, well, if you say that I said that, I don't remember, so then I said it, which is in their mind not really an admonition, or they'll just say, I can't remember if I said it. It'll start with, no, I never did it. No, I never said that lie. I never did it. But that's just one example. Right. Every spirit has a same. They use the same language. They, they play from the. It's like a telephone script. Like you ever work in a job where you got to read. OK, you got to ask this. You got to ask this to troubleshoot down. These evil spirits, they all have the same thing that they say. That's why. Listen, if you ever see me up here chuckle in a council, I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing because I'm like, damn, this spirit really trying this again. You good. That's why they call what they are. A lying spirit, a drunkard spirit. A false spirit. That's their titles. It's a spirit that's making you. That's their title. The scripture says if you have a lying spirit, it doesn't give it any other name. You're a liar. That's what it is. That's their name. That's why they come the same way. And it's years of learning and knowing that and being in councils that lets you decipher that. Okay, this does come in with, or this sister's coming with that type of spirit. Yep. Okay. Or we could look at you. By you, because the scripture says the spirit, the countenance, uh, the countenance, and Don't the way, reveal. and the gate, mm -hmm. and the straight, uh, 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 and the gate, and how you dress, reveal. You already know. That's a hole. Oh, that dude think he who the hell he is. You could tell by the way you carry. You don't realize it because the spirit is so strong on you that you think that's normal. But we, when you out the box, so to speak, you look and you're like, okay, all right. That dude got a spirit of variance on him. That dude got a vain spirit on him. 
Make sense? Right. And this is why you need that discipline, right? Because not in my presence only, when you don't have the brotherhood, when you don't have the other people there to show you stuff, right? You need to be able to use the scriptures to be your mirror, right? Because the scripture talks about that, like as a man that looketh in a glass, right? And behold his natural self. The scriptures is that mirror. And it's then you need to be able to receive the discipline to say, damn, I, I do have this and I do have that. I need to fix this and fix that. Sirach 32 and 14. The book of Sirach, chapter 32, verse 14. Whoso feareth the Lord will receive his discipline, and they that seek him early shall find favor. Remember, it said he's always trying to nourish us with discipline. He's trying to open up our ears so that we can receive it. And he says, if you fear him, You'll receive it. You won't turn it away. Discipline is always knocking at the door. It's whether or not you're going to receive it. And in order to receive it and maintain it, your mind got to be right and your body can't be subject to sin. Read on. He that seeketh the law shall be filled therewith, but the hypocrite will be offended thereat. And there, and there it is. If you, if you seek the law, you'll be filled with discipline. So I say it's easy after that to apply it anywhere else in your life. You're your own worst enemy. You're your own stumbling block outside of that. It says, he that seeketh the law will be filled with it, but hypocrites will be offended thereat. Whether it's by someone else telling you you have it um, or just the mere fact that, man, I ain't going to acknowledge that thing. It's an offense to you. Let's get Baruch 4.13. And you know what that bottom part means? You don't believe. Because if you believed in this Bible, you would not be offended. A hypocrite is somebody who talks the talk but don't walk the walk. That's what that means, that last uh, uh, part of that verse. You said Baruch what? Uh, Baruch 4.13. The book of Baruch, chapter 4 and verse 13. They knew not his statutes, nor walked in the ways of his commandments, nor trod in the paths of discipline in his righteousness. Right. So letting you know that discipline goes with the statutes. It goes with the commandments. It says you must trod in the paths of discipline in his righteousness. Because I said it at the beginning. Discipline is is correlated with the law. It starts with that. You cannot you cannot try to uh, apply discipline in other areas of your life. And then be a hypocrite in this walk. Be a hypocrite when it comes to these scriptures. That's, that, that's just a facade of discipline then. You're trying to apply to other areas. It has to start with this. And if it starts with this, then the rest of it works itself out. I'm not saying there won't be trials that come. There won't be tribulations. But some of you love to say trials and tribulations. And you're the architect of your own trials and tribulations. Like really. What's some other memes? Oh, uh, You'll see those memes. They'll be like, oh. Yeah, uh, dudes be like this and like this. Yeah, I'm dudes, right? You know, you can fill whatever in the blank is, right? Yeah, this be like, damn, my reason for this was this and that, the other. All right, but you got to be able to look in the mirror and say, damn, that's actually me. That's talking about me. I'm this way. The reality is for most of our behaviors, they really aren't excuses. Right? Emotions is so much stronger always and because that's carnal. And that carnal makes you bug out. It makes you bug out. Uh, let me give a few examples of undisciplined behavior as us as a people so you can just kind of see the contrast, and then we're going to wrap it up. Isaiah 30 and 15. The book of Isaiah, chapter 30 and verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall, shall be your strength. Right, so God's telling us, where our strength is, where our rest is. And then what does he say? And ye would not. But we don't want it. We won't apply the discipline. Remember, we just read all this stuff about discipline and the law. He says, if you seek his law, you'll be filled with it. So he says, in returning as an Israelite, in keeping these commandments, in that quietness and confidence of the scriptures, that's your strength. He goes, but ye would not. You don't want none of that. Jeremiah 2 and 31. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 2 and verse 31. O generation, see ye the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness unto Israel, 
a land of darkness. Right. So this is a rhetorical question from God to us. He says, have I been a wilderness? Meaning you can't see because the, the trees are so thick, the forest or the jungle so thick. Have I been darkness to you? No, he's been light. He's always been forthright with us. Remember, we are his portion. He's taught us directly. His face is ever before us in, in the form of this Bible. So he's not been a wilderness. He's not been darkness, right? Because then we might have an excuse. Well, damn, God, you didn't really show us right and wrong. You didn't really tell us this. No, that's not the case. Come on. Wherefore, say my people, we are lords. We will come no more unto thee. Where do you think that you're above God and that you can lean on your own understanding? And we say, we are lords. We'll no more come unto thee. Come on. Can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. He uses the maid with her ornaments and the bride with attire to relate to us. Can you really be an Israelite without the laws? Can you be an Israelite without what God taught you? No. Just like I did when I did that class and I said Thor was just a man when, when uh, Odin, his father, took his powers. But it's not until he gave him back. And why did he take his powers? I brought that example out because he wasn't behaving like he should according to what his father taught him and how he should be. Just like us as a people. So he says, listen, you can't go out. Our uniform, our ornaments, our attire is these laws, statutes, and commandments. And without them, you're just playing at being an Israelite. But you're not. You can't have one without the other. Come on. Why trimmest thou thy way to seek love? Right, because at the end of the day, what it boils down to is that we honor the glory of the Grecians above the glory of our forefathers. We trim our ways. We don't let our light shine because we don't want to rock the boat with everybody else in the world. Come on. Therefore, hast thou also taught the wicked ones thy ways. And you've also now gone and taught the wicked ones our ways, meaning we show them more evil. There's another scripture that talks about we more evil than even they are because uh, that integrity and that perverseness. They, here's the one thing you got to understand when it comes to these other nations. They are just playing the role that they were created for, the ones that aren't is us. And that should put a different perspective in how we deal with things. We, it, yes, it's good to know and, and understand everything that's going on. We should not be up in arms for Esau being the devil, for them being hateful, for them being crafty, for them trying to freaking kill us in different manners, for them trying to condition us. Why? They're more righteous than us because they're doing what God created them for. You know who's not? Us. Us. Give an example, right? Wasn't a video posted on the captain's group? Sisters, Israelites, twerking on the tables of a freaking restaurant where everybody's eating. And the heathen are recording this. Am I wrong? Right. And mind you, it was a, a I'm talking about, it was like a freaking, nice let's, just, restaurant. let's just say it was a golden corral. Right, it wasn't McDonald's. It, was, it wasn't. Or it, Jack in a Box. No, that or Jack it the box. wasn't a restaurant where that type of behavior is accepted. Right. That's the point that I'm getting. I don't know how it started. They went to Old Spaghetti Factory and got up on the tables. Let's hey, put it like it that. It started with one, and then, you know, <laughs> hey, and they got up there, and then the other one got on there and started doing the whole thing. Mockery. Right in a restaurant. And Esau is filming it, right? Because you saw Esau yep. filming it, and Esau was filming Esau That's filming it. That's teaching the wicked like one this. always. Yep. Guess what? For as evil as Esau is, I ain't never seen no white girl jump on no table. Not even at Hooters. Read verse 33 again. <laughs> you, you, you went to the dramatic pauses today, I see. 33 again, and then we go into Ezekiel 9 and 9. Go ahead. Read that in Jeremiah. Verse 33. Why trimmest thou thy way to seek love? Therefore hast thou also taught the wicked ones thy way. Right. We always show in them. We are shown to them. Ezekiel 9 and 9. <laughs> you did the Solomon one. Solomon was the wisest man on earth. Ezekiel 9 and 9. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 9 and verse 9. Then said he unto me, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great. Right. Hey, listen. Judah, we all evil. It says the iniquity of Israel and Judah. 
We, we equal in that when it comes to the most high, right? We know what he said, tense of Judah first, Christ from Judah, I get that. But we are all evil. Our iniquity together as a people is, is the worst, is the worst. That's why he calls it, remember, it's perverseness. Esau, Esau's really not perverse when you think about it because they're doing what they're supposed to do. You know, if a lion doing things that lion do, he right, he justified. But if a lion trying to be a female transgender lion, right? That ain't right, right? And, 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 if, and if the lion knows better and goes contrary to that, who's more wrong? You really got to, man, that's, that's a thing for like a philosophy class. You can sit there and just be like, listen, if this guy is doing what he's meant to do, right? It's kind of like the, um, I had said this before, like a long time ago, I brought this out. I think I actually saw it on Star Trek. Supposedly it's an old Native American thing. And it's a scorpion and a frog. And Bishop has brought it out before too. And uh, Scorpion comes up to the frog and says, hey, man, I need to get across the lake. Can I hop on your back? And the frog's like, hell no. He said, why not? He says, well, you're a scorpion. You're going to sting me when we're halfway across so that you could try to eat me. And he said, bro, how am I going to sting you? He goes, if I sting you, then we both drown and die. And the frog said, you know, that makes a lot of sense. All right, hop on. So they going. Things are all right, you know. He gets halfway over there. The scorpion stings him. The frog said, yo, what'd you do? You just killed us. He said, I'm a scorpion. What did you expect? That's his nature. We're the ones that go against the way God created us to be. So we're the, <laughs> we're the dumb frog, right? We're the dumb frog. Read this, Ezekiel uh, 9 and 9, and then we're done. Then said he unto me, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood. And the city full of perverseness. Of perverseness. We read that definition of perverseness. As a city, as a people, we are full of being stubborn and willfully against the most high God. Come on. For they say, the Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. Right? And because in our minds, we, we start to what you're really saying is, there is no God. He's forsaken us. And when you don't apply the discipline that's required, whether you say that verbally or not, that's essentially what you're saying. Because if you knew and you really had the faith in your heart of an assurity of what's in store for us and what's been promised to us, we would sin less. Right. Like the scripture says and sin less. So I pray you get some understanding on the spirit of discipline. All right. Lord's will. We can all get better at applying it more firmly. Uh, in our lives, in every aspect, all right? So let's get ready for our broadcast, all right? Yeah, look, I like that. Maybe you're the problem. Sometimes hey, sometimes it be like that. Sometimes it be like that. Maybe you're the problem. We got to look at that thing that way. All right, with that we say shalom. We used to scream black power while Heron was pushed. But at the end of the day, nothing's in vain. IUIC has been given a vision. The tents of Judah has risen. Many has attempted the mission. Minor murmuring, omitting, and missing the mark. Just reading that he had the flame of fire in his eyes gave us the spark. We on Paul's mission. We out on the road. Purple and gold. From Mexico, Cuba, Haiti, Ghana, Sierra Leone. 144,000 boots banging, concrete crackling These are how our men repented at heart The scriptures is proof IUIC, we deliver the truth